No, it's it's the same way with us. We we have we have emotional insights that don't necessarily pass the the logic litmus test, but that are right. And so I worked with them, and that was largely in the first book, Apocalypse 2012. I I, I reported on that and became friendly with these guys, and they they somehow knew at the time I was going through a divorce and. Um, uh, Gerardo Barrios, who was my my favorite, he's this ancient-looking caveman guy, you know, with a long black beard and black hair, and he always hmm. carries around an HP laptop stuffed with astronomy software, you know. So he's like, he he knows where every star p p pattern might be, huh? He does, and he loves to use it. And I mean, he carries it around an HP laptop stuffed with software. And a, a bag that has ja a jaguar tooth and beads and you know, <laughs> talismans, and so he and you know he 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 looked at me and he 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 did my reading, which I'm uh, I have to say I'm a little skeptical about that process, but uh, he saw not only um, that I was going through a divorce, but that um, he you know he correctly predicted the outcome of it, which was as most divorces are uh, had its share of pain. Was but he psychic too? Either that or just 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 super intuitive, I you know. Yeah. Um um but he explained to me. I said, "Well, what is the sum up the Mayan prophecy about 2012?" He said, "You know, there's been a lot that's been attributed to that date." Um but he said he didn't think you could say anything more than that 2012 would be the birth of a new era. And like any other birth, it would be accompanied by lots of joy and blood and pain. And me, I was more concerned about the blood and pain part. You know, I mean, you don't have to prepare for joy. You just, you know, revel in it. But the pain and the blood, maybe we could do something about. So I always took that as my guide because there's a lot of people, I think, who've, who've made, made their living recently over-interpreting the Mayan prophecy, the Mayan end date, um, or, or at least... It's it's fine to interpret it, but it's not fine to attribute those interpretations to the ancient Maya, because some you know if 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 I came to you and said I think in 2013 you know Venus is going to blow apart, you're looking me crazy. If I said the ancient Maya astronomers believe that in 2013 Venus is going to blow apart, you say well at least there's a body of knowledge and wisdom that says right, that. Right. Exactly. Uh, and I think there are a lot of folks who've been taking liberties with uh, what the ancient Maya said and. I thought his explanation was good. It, you know, it, 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 2012 is genuinely pivotal in their cosmology, and and we are um, g g emerging into a new era, according to them. Um, and ultimately, the, the news is good, but we might have to go through a lot of extreme discomfort to get there. And I thought, you know, for the second book, I wanted to see if shamans on the other side of the world what they thought about 2012, because I thought if, if they came up with the same basic conclusion that 2012 was this... Then we're in a mess. Yeah, then crash helmet time, you know. And uh, so the, the the word shaman is originally uh, a, an, a Siberian word, an Evenk Siberian word, and the shamans of Siberia, are, are it's it's a very strong culture there, and they're known to be powerful, and, and, and they have a lot of um, uh, credibility there. So I figured I'd I'd go to Siberia and find myself some shamans, you know. Um, and, of course, nothing went right, but everything went better than if it had gone perfectly as planned. Um, all my contacts evaporated, and I'm, I'm uh, wandering around in, uh, uh, near the Mongolian border, and I'm staying in a city called Irkutsk when I, I find out that every two years the Buryat people – who are Mongolian and Mongolian diaspora people, meet for a festival. And this year it happened to be in Irkutsk. And usually the shamans don't go in for this. It's more like you know sports and arts and things. But yeah. the, the shamans were attending this festival. The shamans from, from Mongolia, Siberia, from, from many, many places had traveled to this because there's a magically sunny island called Old Kon, in the middle of Lake Baikal, which is the largest freshwater body of freshwater in the world. And for some reason, this island is sunny 200 days of the year and is warmer than every place around it. And, and so they, it's kind of like the Vatican for shamans of that part of the world. So I, and I just, you know, I lucked out. Or I, I like to think that there was more than luck. It was 
let's call it God's grace or, you know, divine help or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> I found myself there. And so I, I it, it still took some doing because they're, the, the shamans, this is a general rule of thumb if you're, you're dealing with shamans. The ones who will give you the interviews right away are not the ones you want to talk to. The ones that don't want to be interviewed, those are the ones you want. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's almost like there's a, a, a system set up where the ones that want to give you the interview are either just sort of eager for attention or they have a genuine vetting function where they're, they're the, the, the gate that you have to pass through, and then if they give you the nod, you'll get to the, the next layer of shaman. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll get as close as you're going to get to, to the, the, real, the real deal. Well, did you find a lot of similarities between the shamans? I found a great deal of similarities in their methodology, and one um, there are good news and a bad news about 2012. Uh, and this is pretty. I, I spoke to a, a number of folks eventually. I, I'm um, and I, I, I had some luck with that. But the good news about 2012 is that they don't see 2012 as the um, the cataclysmic or apocalyptic date for the world. They do, however, see it, see it as the avalanche date for the collapse of the West. Really? Yeah. So they're like, no, frankly. They were that specific? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry. Not I, I, good. Like, All of them? Universally? No, but there, there, was, no one who, there was no one who disagreed. Some, some were more vociferous than others, but there was, there was no naysayer in the bunch. Uh, and I did interview uh, – at different times and locations, uh, you know, and particularly out in Old Cone, it was kind of scary. But um, and George, I, I, I know this is going to sound um, well unusual, but um, not on this show. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. You you you, you cast your net broadly, don't you? Um, I'm as I wrote in both books. I'm distantly descended from uh, a man named Abu Jahal, whose name means the father of ign ignorance. He's the greatest villain in the history of Islam. You're, you're Lebanese, aren't you? I am. I am. Okay. And Lebanese Christian. But you get the same last name as the is Danny Thomas. Did you know that? No. Yeah, his real name was uh, was Joseph. I didn't know his that. Last name, sure thing. Amos. I think it was Amos Joseph. I think that was his real name. Well, I I've always admired him, so I'm happy for the the coincidental association. Um. Uh, I've I had the opportunity to go to Lebanon uh, quite a while ago and trace my heritage back to pre-Islamic times, and um, I found that I descend from this fellow named Abu Jahal, who tried three times to kill the Prophet Muhammad. And peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, you know, I have, have have no truck with what my ancestor tried to do, but he was a he was a pagan. He was a, a nature worshiper, and he. He worshipped the moon, and he wanted the satanic verses included in the Quran. And when Muhammad wouldn't hear of it, uh, Abu Jahal tried to kill him. So how this w was known by these Siberian shamans, I will never, ever guess. But on, on two separate occasions, two different days, two different locations, I really don't think there are any cell phones involved. Um, shamans... They, they, you know, usually I, I interview them. That's my job is to go there and, and ask them. They, they began asking me questions about my heritage, and both of them came to the conclusion that I had descended from this this man. It was as though they could smell it on me. We're talking 1,500 years. That's bizarre. It was bizarre. And they, they were not – they were neither receptive nor antagonistic to this finding uh they're a little one of them was a little concerned about it but it was more that that abu jahal was an evil man who who worshiped nature in, in in ways that they they admire you know they shamans are you you could say nature worshipers um you know they they revere the the, the ground beneath their feet and the sky above and, and they communicate with it in, in in very special sensitive ways and um they the reason I was able to get to so many of them was because they felt that I had sort of this heritage or destiny to fulfill, and to fulfill my, but not doing it as an evil murderer, you know, but as a hopefully a good guy. And um, so it was, it was an incredibly complex and rich emotional experience. Um, 
to to talk with these 